New anti-smoking laws have reduced our exposure to secondhand smoke, but you still may be at risk. Stay tuned for Health Politics. Welcome to Health Politics with Dr. Mike McGee, a weekly program exploring important trends in health. In healthcare, it can sometimes feel like we're just spinning our wheels. That examples of progress are few and far between and that getting ahead of the disease curve is just out of reach. But when a ray of hope comes shooting through the clouds, it's often because good science has met with good policy. A perfect example, secondhand smoke regulation. I'm sure many of you remember the days when people smoked wherever they wanted, whenever they wanted, no matter who was in the room. There was smoking on airplanes, in restaurants, in hospitals, and in the workplace. In fact, besides the home, the workplace is the top location where individuals are involuntarily exposed to secondhand smoke. But over the last few decades, as definitive evidence has accumulated that secondhand smoke causes disease and premature death, we've been making legislative and therefore public health related progress in this area. Smoking bans in the workplace are a good example. They now exist in 11 U.S. states. That's 11 states where respiratory health is being improved, chronic diseases are being prevented, and people have the chance to live longer because they're not exposed to secondhand smoke at work. The progress we've made here should be adapted and applied to other areas where smoke bans can make a difference. Because even though current trends are encouraging, nearly one of every two people living in the United States is still being exposed to secondhand smoke. So let's take a look at how workplace smoking bans came to be. The battle over secondhand smoke exposure initially focused on pregnant women, their fetuses, and children. Early concerns included premature birth and death, lung cancer, and increased risk of coronary heart disease. Much of the public health focus was geared toward information campaigns that tapped into parents' concerns for the health of their children. When California became the first U.S. state to take the issue into the workplace, the state provided a study lab for health outcomes of preventive health legislation. In 1998, a research group found that California's smoking ban reduced secondhand smoke exposure among bartenders. They found that with reduced exposure to smoke, the bartenders experienced decreased nasal eye and throat irritations, decreased coughing, wheezing, and shortness of breath, and improvements in their pulmonary function tests. Some eight years later, similar findings were confirmed among Scottish bar workers following Scotland's prohibition of smoking in confined spaces in March of 2006. These findings coincided with lower levels of the chemical cotinine, which is a biological marker present in the blood after exposure to secondhand smoke. Other studies in New York City, Ireland, Norway, and New Zealand have added weight to the evidence. The investigation into secondhand smoke exposure and the evidence that continues to build is intersecting with a decade of studies on a particular subgroup of patients, adult asthmatics. Indoor pollutants had long been suspected as causative agents in these adults whose acute wheezing and air constriction occurred rapidly and at times with deadly results. After the smoking ban went into effect in Scotland, asthmatic bartenders showed even greater improvement in lung function than their non-asthmatic co-workers. For those who had already had chronic airway disease, the ban was doubly important. All of this makes good sense which makes many people wonder why it often takes so long to arrive at healthy approaches such as workplace smoking bans. The answer is that it takes extraordinary leadership and persistence to shift human behavior. Between 1988 and 2002, as a result of changes in our personal and public spaces, the degree of exposure to secondhand smoke as measured by serum cottonine levels in those age four and older has declined by 70% among non-smokers. That's the good news. But the bad news, as I mentioned before, is that 43% of our population still experiences some level of continued exposure. And for children and African Americans, the numbers are even higher. What to do? We need to stress a smoke-free continuum, 
from home to workplace to home. This means strong, ongoing public health campaigns that tap into multi-generational health responsibilities. It also means zero tolerance, especially when it comes to bars, taverns, and casinos. Here, the workers are exposed to four to six times more secondhand smoke than workers in standard settings. We also need to clear up some common misconceptions and old arguments that continue to slow corrective legislation. First of all, the claim that laws restricting workplace smoking don't work is simply not true. Adherence levels range from 76% to 99%. Next, it's been said that the general public won't support legislation to mandate smoke-free bars and restaurants. That's not true either. In fact, in the U.S. and beyond, patrons support legislation, and this support increases over time. Third, it's inaccurate to think that these regulated establishments will collapse financially. Studies including bars, restaurants, and hotels show no loss of income. Fourth, many say smoking bans are unfair to smokers who are inconvenienced or experience no real benefit. The reality is smoking bans in the workplace result in higher rates of smoking cessation in workers who smoke and lower cigarette consumption among those who continue to smoke. For example, after the ban in Ireland, 15% of the smokers quit immediately. Sometimes all you need is a little nudge. So what can we take away from the story of secondhand smoke? Number one, it takes time to build a body of compelling evidence and you have to keep at it. Number two, it's useful to have confirmatory studies arising from different people and nations around the globe. Number three, Restrictive legislation offers a unique opportunity to document health improvements and reinforce continual expansion of positive health policy. Number four, we should keep our eyes open for surprising outcomes at the intersection of discrete populations, as was the case here with adult asthmatics. And number five, we must reinforce that positive health demands a healthy behavior continuum from home to workplace to home. Such a continuum requires excellent, compelling information on the one hand and courageous and determined legislative action on the other. For Health Politics, I'm Mike McGee. Thank you for watching Health Politics with Dr. Mike McGee. For more information on this topic, please visit our related web links, discussion guide, or downloadable transcript and slides. For videos and information on a variety of other health topics, visit our homepage at healthpolitics.org. If you would like to subscribe to our free weekly video, click on subscribe to Health Politics and enter your email address. Again, thank you for watching.